Billy Bragg, welcome back to, to, to Blue's Fest. Here we are. Here we go then. And you just come off stage and a huge crowd as well. Yeah. One more time, your Uncle Bill. Good. Getting up there and getting a few songs away was great. I mean, I've been in Australia a week and I haven't done a bloody gig and I'm gagging for a bit of gig. to do that, finally done it. I was fired off a load of songs and I said, look, God, I'm going to be finished in like 30 minutes here if I don't slow down a bit. I'm so excited. But you were quite chatty as well. I mean, you were, you were, you were Yeah, kind of yeah, once I sussed engaging. out, once I sussed out with the audience were like, yeah, I kind of talk to them a little bit, always a bit of that. But you know, it's, you have been here a week and you've been quite busy, even though yeah, you haven't been playing. Yeah, I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have been talking quite a bit about Australian issues. Mm -hmm. You've been coming here for a while, obviously. 30 years this year. Uh, you're obviously quite across, you know, Australian politics, the things that, are, Australian culture, the things that are happening mm. here, mm. and uh, have been quite vocal about it. Um, well, you know, I think you, when you come to a place like this, you've got, you know, a festival like this, you've got to let the audience know you know where you are. There's a few ways of doing that. You know, one's to put the local football team shirt on. That works really well. Although it tends to upset half the crowd. Uh, or you pick up on an issue, you know, it just so happened that when the band before me went on, I heard the, their introduction, and the woman who introduced me was talking about the, you know, raising money for the victims of the uh, Northern Rivers flood. And uh, I just thought, you know, while I was singing, I ain't got no home in this world anymore. It occurred to me there was a, a resonance in that. So I thought, you know, if I if I make a re reference to that, you know, just let audience know that I know where I am. I know what's been going. You know, a little bit about the plight of those people. But you're always very aware. I try to be, yeah. I try to, you know, when I'm when I'm visiting somewhere, I try and keep uh, keep across some of the stuff what's going on. You know, sometimes it's it's easy, like in Australia with an English language culture. Sometimes you're in a, a foreign language culture, it's not so easy. But you know, you don't want to go around in isolation in a tour bus, imagining you're you know in your own little world. You want to be, you want to know where you are. You want to feel where you are. Now we saw you performing on your own, mm. but on on Monday. Uh, at Blues Fest, you're performing with Joe Henry, and that's a project mm. that you've been working with for quite a while. Yeah, can uh, you just explain a little sure, bit sure, about that? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, Joe and I um, recorded an album of classic railroad songs on a train between Chicago and Los Angeles in uh, March of last year, over four or five days. And um, when the train pulled into the larger stations, um, Amtrak used the big railway stations, the city stations, as a kind of a temporary siding. So when a train comes in, instead of just five minutes to load passengers, they have a wait time, which allows freight trains to go by. Because most of the, between the cities, most of the track is single track. So in the schedule, there's, you know, sort of St. Louis, 20 minutes, Fort Worth, 30 minutes, you know, uh, Austin, 10 minutes, you know. So in those, looking at the schedule, there's time there to get off the train, find somewhere, acoustically uh, viable to record and, and do a few takes of one of these songs and then jump back on a train. As long as we stayed in visual contact with the train. And then some of the cool. tracks you can actually hear people walking past. Yeah, well we wanted, we wanted people to come with, on the journey with us. We, wanted, you know, we didn't want to just go in the studio and make a cold record, you know, Bill and Joe love trains, that would have been boring. We wanted the people to listen on headphones and come with us. And, and so we, we mic'd each other, but we also had two mics at right angles to pick up the ambient noise of the station. But trains have been such an important part of American culture oh, yeah. in song yeah, yeah, yeah. for and so long. Every style of song as well, everything. It must uh, have been hard to cull, you know. Well, you know, we, we had to try and get a bit. balance between the, the narrative we were trying to put across. You know, we couldn't record every song. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we did a pretty good job of getting a balance between, you know, the, the I mean, Lead Belly is our kind of guiding light. He has a lot of train songs and he supplied four of the songs. So that kind of covered us for our sort of base. And then and we took it as far as, um, you know, uh, uh, Early Morning Rain by Gordon Lightfoot and uh, Gentle On My Mind, two songs from our lifetime rather than everything being prehistoric music, you know. Well, there's a song on there called Rock Island Line, yeah. which segues nicely into another thing that you're working on, because mm. Rock Island Line was a bit big hit for a Scottish singer called Lonnie Donegan. The great Lonnie Donegan, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've been writing something, a book about yeah, Skiffle. Yeah, Which was... It's really kind of like uh, a book that tries to uh, 
contextualize the period in British history when our pop music went from being a kind of jazz based confection for adults to a guitar led music for teenagers and and Donegan is the is the key moment when it begins to change he has that hit in January 1956 with Rock Island Line and it just inspires a whole generation of quite young you know sort of 13 14 and 15 those were the ages of George Harrison, Paul McCartney and John Lennon when I went to see Donegan mm. in Liverpool in 1956, um, after which they all went off and formed bands. Mm. And Donegan is the first British artist to get in the charts playing a guitar. So it's a kind of crucial moment, you know, and it has many, many similarities with punk as well. It's kind of like a here's three chords now formal band kind of music. So in a way, if there hadn't been Skiffle, maybe you wouldn't have got started. If they hadn't been Skiffle, there'd been no Beatles. Yeah. The Beatles were originally a Skiffle band. Yeah. It, yeah. I think it's the it's the kind of like urge of young British, uh, uh, the first generation actually, the first generation of British teenagers trying to make their own culture rather than have to accept their parents' culture, and they turn to American folk and blues in order to do that. You know, they, they Donegan recorded Lead Belly songs, he recorded Woody Guthrie songs, he recorded Carter Family songs, and others followed in his wake, and they're almost all train songs. Now you mentioned punk rock yeah. just now, and. You emerged out of that wave of, of punk that happened mm. in the late 70s and yeah. early 80s. Um, and you, you had that rage as well, and you had the uh, political clout. And is it hard to maintain that same level of intensity that we just saw out there on stage? I don't find it hard. You know, I kind of like get, get a, a lot of my power from the audience's reactions, you know. And they kind of recharge my activism for me, and I, and I hope I do the same for them. And are we going to hear some new music from you soon? For sure, yeah. I mean, I've been writing some new songs. Um, obviously, uh, playing with Joe, I haven't had an opportunity to air all of it, but uh, yeah. The events of the last 12 months in the UK, and in America and elsewhere are quite... Uh, keep you focused. Absolutely. We look forward to hearing that, Billy, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Lovely place you've got.